We're glad to have Bob Costas with us tonight. Good to see you, sir. Thank you. Um, Maya culpa. Mm -hmm. uh, anybody going to be as brave during the 2022 opening ceremonies as you were in 96 and 08? I don't know uh, that it's possible. These are daunting circumstances. NBC has taken about 90% of its operation to its headquarters in Stanford, Connecticut. Most of the producers, most of the broadcasters will be there. That's a good move because the COVID protocols are so tight that even asymptomatic athletes are likely to test positive at some point and then be quarantined in China. Uh, NBC is responsible for a small army of personnel. And so to get as many of them out of there to begin with uh, is a good idea. Um, those who remain, um, I don't know exactly what measures the Chinese might take, but they have been known to take extreme measures. Uh, an innocent enough or insipid enough tweet from the former general manager of the Houston Rockets saying stand with Hong Kong got Rockets games pulled off Chinese t TV, and it's a big market for the NBA, for several months. And when Ennis Cantor of the Celtics made similar comments this season, boom, Celtics games gone. So now you're NBC, you've got this billions upon billions of dollars of investment there, and you've got no fans in the stands. It's COVID hangs over it like a dark cloud. Then everybody knows by now, maybe in 2008, the world wasn't as fully aware. And, and in truth, the Chinese regime, objectionable as it was in 2008, is much worse now. And the genocide and the human rights violations are worse now. And it's impossible to ignore it. It's a giant elephant in the room. Um, but if they address it more than t tangentially, more than just acknowledging it, if they opine about it, who's to say what the Chinese might do uh, in retaliation? And the NBC uh, executives are responsible for all of their personnel there. So I'm not quite sure how uh, they will be able to address it, if at all. It's a great point. And, and you have a lot of people over there who their, their safety and their freedom relies on mm -hmm. the, the goodwill of the Chinese. You say that the Chinese are a lot worse than they were in 2008. There's no question. They've been emboldened in every way. We looked back at the bidding for the 2022 games. Um, one of the other cities that mm -hmm. was up was Oslo. Uh, Oslo versus Beijing. Oslo, of the 14 categories the IOC measures, Oslo was favored in 12 of them, and Beijing won. Uh, government support, finance, and marketing being the only categories uh, that Oslo didn't win in. Why is the IOC continue to be in the pockets of these regimes? Yeah, and plus Oslo is a natural winter games location yeah, where there. Beijing is is not. Yeah, there's there's snow there. It's part of what defines the nation. Uh, in addition to twice being in Beijing, 08 and 22, uh, they were also in Sochi in 2014. Uh, and I confronted, uh, figuratively, uh, Vladimir Putin wouldn't come in for an interview, but we spoke about it very directly at that time uh, and all of the objectionable aspects of that authoritarian regime. And as you pointed out, although the Olympics uh, closely guard their footage. Every time, at least three or four Olympics, when I interviewed the presidents of the IOC, one of the questions always was, can you explain uh, the IOC's strange affinity for authoritarian nations? And I asked Thomas Bach, who is now the president of the IOC in Sochi, are you comfortable with the Olympic flame burning over Vladimir Putin's Russia? And the answer always is, well, you know, we like to move it around to various locations, and we feel that the presence of the Olympics in any given country might moderate their behavior and move them toward democratic or Olympic ideals. And my response to that is, how's that working out? How's that working out? Yeah. Anything moving in the right direction in China uh, or in Russia? Um, and now after that ramble on my part, I've forgotten your question, Leland. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> well, no, I, I, think, I think actually you did answer it, which is that the reason that the IOC continues to oh. give these authoritarian regimes the games is because of money, which is what it comes down to. And it's the same reason that American companies continue to sponsor. This from the New York Times, for Olympic sponsors, China is an exception. Pressure is mounting on companies to condemn the country's human rights violations, but executives say the mm -hmm. game should not be politicized. These are the very same companies that are just fine politicizing the NFL or the NBA games and sponsoring athletes who are very political uh, for U.S. sports. But when it comes to the Olympics, say no, no, see no evil, say no evil, speak no evil.
Yeah, a couple of things here. First of all, the IOC is beyond disingenuous. They have politicized these games simply by putting them in Beijing. Let's say, okay, 2008, um, they want to open the games up to Asia, and they've since gone to South Korea for winter games and back to Tokyo for summer games, and maybe the full extent of the horrors of the Chinese regime weren't clearly evident to the rest of the world, but to go back to them so quickly when everything was known in 2015 is unconscionable. And yes, having an advantage in finance and marketing, the two advantages out of the 14 uh, bullet points that they had over Oslo and Norway, that goes to security, which is a legitimate concern, and infrastructure and whatnot. But the other part that we can't exactly quantify, but common sense tells us, the poobahs of the IOC like to be treated royally. Vladimir mm. Putin spent a ruble's equivalent of $50 billion on the Sochi Olympics. There's an unlimited budget. The government mm. doesn't have to account for anything. The CCP doesn't have to account for anything. And if that means, wink, wink, making things even nicer for IOC officials, who's to say that doesn't happen? Stands yeah. to reason it does. For, for sure. Um, are you, and it's a rhetorical question, but some executives you talk to about it, major U.S. companies about continuing to sponsor the Olympics and dealing with the Chinese, mm -hmm. they offer the same straw man argument that the IOC does, right? That if we bring Apple to China, then hopefully people will see and the regime will be moderated. It's never right. worked. Is the fact that the Uyghurs are in the conditions that they are, and we now know that what is happening to that group of people, a couple of million of uh, a religious minority in China, that is so similar to what was happening in the 1930s in Germany. Is there going to be any pressure on American corporations to finally take a stand, or does the almighty Juan take, take supreme power? I, I think it's reaching critical mass and widespread public understanding that cuts across political lines. So there may indeed be some pressure in that direction. You know, it isn't just sports. Sports is the most visible thing, especially when you talk about an Olympics. But you know that that's a huge market for entertainment interests, for Hollywood. And there are a number of films that have been edited, seen differently in China than seen elsewhere in the world, edited so as not to, quote, offend the CCP. Mm -hmm. Take out anything uh, that might offend them or might open the eyes of a Chinese audience to what is going on elsewhere in the world in contrast to what's happening in their nation. Anything at all that upsets the Chinese government, it's just too big a market for many business interests in the United States uh, not to not to bow to, which is really what it amounts to in many circumstances. Yeah, for another organization as well, it is a business interest, right, which is the NFL, who uh, launched their mm -hmm. expansion team uh, in foreign markets, uh, and they provided this map. Uh, this was a couple of weeks ago, maybe even a month ago, and the map that they showed showed Taiwan being part of China, uh, and that they were mm -hmm. then sort of gave these teams to different countries to try to have home team advantage and all this other kind of stuff. The Chinese... Uh, get the Los Angeles Rams. China includes Taiwan. Uh, Chinese Chinese was fine with this. The NFL's selling lots of merchandise and TV rights, et cetera, in China. Let me just flip it around. If the NFL had made a map um, and actually had some moral courage that had Taiwan as a separate country and given them a different team, what would have happened? Well, I think there would have been some sort of response just based on the precedent uh, where they tried to get me fired uh, or failing that issue a public apology way back in 1996 and taking NBA games off the air, there would have been some sort of reaction, not just some tweet or we object. There would have been some sort of reaction that exacted some sort of commercial price because hmm. that's the playbook in China. Wanted to get you your thoughts on the NFL and um of what I did get wrong, I got, I got right that you had spoken out long about CTE and were one of the first people to ring the alarm bells and really talk about that and hold yeah. the, the NFL to account. They had the ratings dip in 2020 as so much of BLM and the social justice issues came to be. And then this past week, uh, record numbers watching the Bills, Chiefs, the Rams, Bucks, 49ers, Packers, Bengals, Titans. What has the NFL figured out about the American psyche that they are impenetrable 
to falling out of favor with American viewers? Well, in fairness, all sports took a dip in 2020 because of COVID. Uh, games had to be moved around. There were no fans in the stands for the most part. That takes atmosphere away. People's state of mind and their habits were altered. But all sports have bounced back to some extent uh, in 2021 and now 22. But the NFL has long been the colossus, not only in American sports, in American entertainment. You look at the top 100 rated shows in a given year, and 75, 80 of them are NFL games. Um, so it has a lot of advantages. A, if you can look away from some of the concerns, especially what it does uh, to the brains of too many of its participants, and then other scandals and objectionable things that, that uh, have come up around the NFL in recent years. And they're not unique in that. That happens elsewhere in sports too, but the NFL is the one which we pay the most attention to. People look away from that, even those who have expressed mm -hmm objections to some of these circumstances, they're caught up in the excitement of the games. You play once a week. When you get to the playoffs, Leland, every game in the NFL playoffs is the equivalent of a seventh game in baseball, basketball, or hockey. They're all do or die elimination games. Played at the time at a time of the year when most of the country is inside because of the weather and, and all the rest. Gambling has always been a big part of it. Now you have legalized gambling, which feeds into it. And this past week, these games were so compelling. They all came down to the very last play. Pretty hard to turn away from that, even if you are skeptical about some aspects of the NFL. People have been able to turn away from the Olympics. Ratings continue to plummet. Are they going to go down even farther for 2022? I wish all my friends and colleagues at NBC well, and I know they will do a very good job under extraordinarily difficult conditions. No network has ever been dealt a hand as difficult as this one, but you got a combination of circumstances here. First of all, people's viewing habits have changed. Uh, so if you're just talking about the rating in prime time and standard broadcast television, that was going to go down under any circumstances. But now people have a bad feeling about China. We're talking about Americans now. Uh, COVID puts a damper on it. No fans in the stands, no family uh, of the competitors, and emotion and sentiment matters more in the presentation of an, of an Olympics than other sports events. And since most of the broadcasters won't be there, you won't even have the fresh-faced youngster from the United States who's just won a medal coming in and sitting yeah. down with Mike Tirico, the host. You won't have any of that. So NBC is not to blame. They're going to make the best of, of a circumstance yeah. that they never anticipated when they bid billions and billions of dollars for every Olympics through 2032. Um, well, what I can say is... Um, when my phone rang yesterday and it was you, I'm, I'm glad it ended up uh, with this conversation today. Hopefully, I won't have to insult you to get you back, come back on the program, all right? You, you didn't insult me. In fact, you impressed me. Uh, if I have a moment here, every public figure knows that every person and every situation are mischaracterized to some extent inevitably, no matter how well you've been treated in the big picture, it's inevitable with social media, with hyperpartisan media. There's stuff out there that isn't just wildly outrageous opinions. There's stuff out there about everybody and everything that's factually wrong. The difference is that you cared about it. You immediately wanted to make it right. You didn't just say, hey, I, I won't do that again. You said, what can I do? I thought I was just going to have a private conversation with you as a fellow St. Louisan, and we have mutual friends. Mm -hmm. Instead, you said, let me correct this immediately. That should be par for the course, but it's not anymore. And it's admirable that you wanted to do it, and I thank you for that. Well, we thank you for coming on, um, and I know we have some mutual friends who will both um, – be glad that, that you and I were together on the screen. Um, something I've, I've thought about since I uh, used to listen to you. Good to see you. Thank you, Leland. Congratulations on your new show. Yeah, thank, thank you. Once criticized, cops are now under fire. 24, 24 have been killed or injured in the past 28 days. We are not safe anymore. Not even the members of the service. Here, one widow, straightforward message to soft on crime DAs. Plus, why these killings may not be the wake up call that creates change. But I promise, we promise, that your death won't be in vain. I love you to the end of time. We'll take the watch from here. 
That's the widow of NYPD officer Jason Rivera, who's one of the two officers killed in the line of duty earlier this week in New York City. As you can see, tens of thousands of police officers in their dress blues filled the streets of New York to say their goodbyes. As you can see in some of these images that we are showing you now, the city that never sleeps actually stopped. Officer Rivera's murder adds to the tally of an already especially violent and deadly year for police around the country. According to the Officer Down Memorial page, at least six officers have been killed in the line of duty. Four were shot, two others were run over intentionally. Here's their pictures. Just this month, in the January of 2022, an additional 20 police officers were injured in shootings. That's almost one per day. Cities across the country, as you can see from this map, from Las Vegas to the Bronx to Gary, Georgia. Three shot yesterday in Houston. One was killed a couple of days before that. Two shot in two days in Milwaukee. Two shot earlier this week near St. Louis, Missouri in Ferguson. The list goes on. Sadly, there's a common theme. Many of the officers were shot by criminals with long rap sheets. In many cases, they were out on bail from other crimes. For example, the Milwaukee shooter, three open warrants, 2020 felony fleeing an officer, August 2020 felony operating a vehicle without an owner's consent, August 2020 felony bail jumping, and he was still on the streets. The DA in Milwaukee continues to enforce a nearly decade-old policy of diversion, treatment, and low or no bail. In fact, he pioneered the practices, saying it would be more equitable. In 2007, he famously said, is there going to be an individual I divert or put into treatment programs who's going to go out and kill somebody? You bet, guaranteed, it's going to happen. That's the DA in Milwaukee. It's a similar story in Houston, where the man who shot three cops benefited from the bail reforms that allow repeat offenders back out on the streets. Earlier this month, he was arrested for aggravated robbery with a deadly weapon and unlawful carrying of a weapon with a felony conviction. Those stemmed from a 2010 conviction and 2013 arrest. Yet he was out on bail. Police let him on a high-speed chase. He shot three officers, allegedly carjacked another car before finally giving himself up. In New York, 16-year-old Carmen Williams, known as C. Blue to rap fans, was on probation for a 2020 gun possession arrest. He allegedly shot but didn't kill an NYPD officer this week and is now free on $250,000 bond. The New York Post reports he posted just $15,000 in cash thanks to state bail reform laws. There's some of the cash. For obvious reasons, it's difficult to secure interviews with the district attorneys and state lawmakers who institute these reforms. In Los Angeles, George Gascon explains the reforms and why they are necessary this way. In many ways, we cannot prosecute our way out of social inequalities, income inequalities, the unhoused, the desperation that we have. The DA said last month that the tough on crime approach has failed and that, quote, we are trying dramatically to change a system that has not served no one, not the victims of crime, not those that are accused and not the public. He isn't the only big city DA with such a view. We focused earlier on the violence against police in New York. Five have been shot since the first of the year. That's the same time the new district attorney, Alvin Bragg, has been in office. This is the policy he put out in the beginning of his time. We will not seek a carceral, meaning prison sentence, except with homicides and a handful of other cases, including domestic violence, felonies, some sex crimes, and public corruption. That was the memo he put out to prosecutors. He later walked back this memo. The purpose of the memo is to provide prosecutors with a framework for how to approach cases in the best interest of safety and justice. Each case is fact specific. Bragg attended today's funeral of the two police officers in New York. Back now to Jason Rivera's widow, who addressed Alvin Bragg directly. The system continues to fail us. We are not safe anymore. Not even the members of the service. I know you were tired of these laws, especially the ones from the new DA. I hope he's watching you speak through me right now. Police around the country feel the same way. Among the officers shot this month, two in the town of Ferguson near St. Louis. You'll remember it from the first BLM riots in 2015. Since then, a reformed-minded prosecutor has taken over. 
former chief of police for St. Louis County, now County Commissioner Tim Fitch is with, with us. Uh, if this is not a wake up call, which it, in some ways it appears not to be because DAs continue to say that they believe in these quote unquote reforms, what will be? Well, Leo and I will tell you that many of these reform prosecutors are up for their first attempt at reelection this year. And I think it's going to show the public's going to tell them we're tired of this. You've gone too far to the left. You're letting criminals be heroes in our community. And it's just encouraging these kind of attacks, not just on police officers, but on private citizens as well. I hate to disagree with you, but at least one of the sort of most prominent of the reform minded prosecutors, Kim Fox here in Chicago, and she won re-election overwhelmingly. And by the way, so did Kim Gardner in the city of St. Louis. Uh, she's not up this time. Prosecutor in St. Louis County is. He hasn't been nearly as easy on criminals as Kim Gardner right next door in the city. And the two officers that were shot here in St. Louis on Wednesday, thankfully, uh, it looks like they're going to be okay. Uh, one's not out of the woods yet. But the, the important piece of this was they chased these individuals out of the city of St. Louis into St. Louis County. So they had to deal with a different prosecutor. They weren't dealing with that well, very so, far so, left. So, in, so you're telling me that there are police officers now who are intentionally driving or forcing suspects into different jurisdictions where there's different prosecutors? I wouldn't go that far. That's where the pursuit led them into St. Louis okay. County out of the city of St. Louis. But like I said, literally a mile from the city limits, if they were still in the city, this would probably be a much different story as far as prosecution of these individuals. Wow. Uh, you know, I thought when I was looking at the images of the thousands, tens of thousands of police officers in New York uh, who came to honor those two fallen officers, I thought, who would now sign up to be a police officer? I know you've got grandkids, would, I, they're young, but if, if they were 18, 19, 20, 22 and said, hey, Grandpa, I, I'm going to go be a, a cop like you were, what would you tell them? I would encourage it. Uh, I encourage it with my own son who decided not to go into law enforcement. He started uh, in the Air Force and the military uh, police and decided not to go into the civilian service because it was right in the middle of Ferguson when he got out of the military. And he saw how the police here were being treated by many in the public and the media and said, it's not for me anymore. Uh, that's my fear is that good people will stop becoming police officers, but we need them to do that. If they don't step up and do it, then the criminals win and we can't let that happen. Aren't they winning already? Unfortunately, it looks that way. But think about those two young St. Louis City police officers that chased this homicide suspect into St. Louis County on Wednesday. They didn't give up. They went after him full mm -hmm. steam ahead. They pursued him, uh, pulled out. They all had uh, weapons and fired and shot these two officers. It didn't stop them from doing their job. Thank God we have people like them still. Indeed, and thank God they're going to be okay, as are the officers in Houston who, as we watched the video yesterday, we commented on it, run, ran towards the sound uh, of gunfire and into that. Um, it's always good to see you, sir. Thank you, and thanks for the perspective. We'll talk soon. Absolutely. Thank All you for the invitation. All right. Some border agents now confronting DHS Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. We're going to tell you what they said as the migrant crisis reaches new levels. Welcome back. We've been covering the border all week, and now there is leaked audio from a meeting between Border Patrol agents in Arizona and the Department of Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas, showing just how angry the agents are. On Wednesday, the secretary was addressing the agents' complaints about the Biden administration's immigration policies. Cameras were not allowed in these meetings. The agents felt they weren't getting the proper resources to deal with the record influx of migrants crossing illegally. This is audio obtained by town hall of the agents confronting the secretary. Every time something important comes here, uh, we rush out. We have 50 more buses that come in, and they take as many people out of here as they can. You guys keep saying you want to see how it really is down here. Why do we keep sending as many people out of here, out of here as we can before they get here? It's not really showing what it is. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure I call it. Sorry. <laughs> it may appear that people are trying to showcase that everything country story. We know that. I know that. The commitment remains and we'll keep fighting. And 
let me let me just say, you can turn your back on me, but I'll never turn your back on my back on you. You did the day you were appointed. Searing. This is one of the reasons they're so angry. We've been showing you this video all week of migrants, single adult males being released into the San Antonio airport and at bus stops, free to go anywhere in the U.S. they want. Some of these migrants allegedly have criminal records. They're supposed to check in with immigration authorities at some point, but often they don't. Thursday, attorneys generals from 12 states met along the border in Texas to discuss what they can do collectively to combat illegal immigration, although given it's a federal issue, they're perhaps as precious little. Joining us now, Indiana Attorney General Todd Rokita, who was at the border and is in Texas right now. I, I appreciate, really, that you all go down and see this and try to do something about it. I know every state now has become a border state, but effectively, other than sound bites and sending letters, is there anything a, a state attorney general can do about this? Well, yeah, Leland, thanks for having us on. We're just north of the border now, heading back to Indiana. And um, as I was down in Texas gathering evidence, uh, we filed a lawsuit. So this is not a congressional seat where you, where you might be more accurate. Send a letter, vote yes or no. Uh, we have, um, we have uh, more ammunition and, and, and even a gun and a knife in the sense that we can file lawsuits and start investigations. And in fact, many like-minded attorney generals, attorneys general have, and there were 12 of us on the border uh, just yesterday and today, because what we realize and what we know and what is common sense in Indiana, we call it Hoosier common sense, is that what's going on down at the border in terms of these single white males who are backed by cartels, ruthless, uh, who don't care anything about making money, they certainly are willing to destroy this country. And they're sending these migrants, these, 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 these single males, um, and these illegal aliens uh, as hostages or to commit crimes just on their own. And so in 48 hours, Leland, from the time you cross the border illegally down here, you can be in Indiana, you are in Indiana, uh, raising, raising our, our, no, I, our crime. I, look, I, I, there's no question, we've, and we've covered a lot of that and, and talked about it. At the same time, how do you separate the fact that a lot, of these, a lot of these people are normal people, I was down on the border as well, who are coming to America for a better life, they're coming illegally, but be that as it may, they're not, they're at the same time not criminals uh, in, the, in the sense of the word of what you're saying. How do you separate those two groups? I don't think you should have to, necessarily. Uh, illegal is illegal. We're going to be, Leland, we're going to either be a country of laws or we're not. And, and if you're going to break, the first thing you do to get to our country is break the law. Uh, I don't think you want to live our values. I don't think you want to be, uh, become American, and maybe not even assimilate. Uh, and, and, and yeah, I understand there's people that are being held hostage by these cartels, and, and we have sympathy for them. Uh, but that doesn't stop what the law is. That doesn't mean you throw the law away. And now you have Biden, uh, who's being a lawbreaker himself, who's not enforcing the Remain in Mexico policy that I and about 14 other attorneys general got the United States Supreme Court to reinstate. That's the Trump policy that said, yes, we feel sympathy for you. And while we examine your asylum case, you're going to stay in Mexico, which de-incentivizes the whole reason to come in the first no. place, especially if you're an employee of a cartel, if you're a hostage of a cartel. You know, I, I, couldn't so, agree, I couldn't agree with you more that the difference between what was happening during the Trump administration and now during the Biden administration is absolutely night and day. Remain in Mexico uh, certainly changed that. When we were down at the border, um, it was very obvious. And as you point out, sending people back just isn't happening. And I guess that's maybe the point, that you're suing TikTok, you're suing the administration, and even once the courts rule in your favor, it doesn't seem to be making a difference. Well, yeah, that, and that could be a whole separate question. Elections do have consequences, but we are at a tipping point here as a country. And when the leader of our country uh, decides to be a lawbreaker himself, not follow the rule of law, not follow the Constitution, yeah. we're in a whole other environment, Leland, and it's, it is it is scary, uh, and it, it makes you realize that every vote has to count, which is a whole other issue uh, coming into 2022. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, so. we're, we're, covering, we're covering a lot of things. Um, I, I want to I drill down more on what's happening in, in Indiana, because it's important sort of for sure. people to understand how things, the border states aren't just on the border. Unfortunately, we're a little out of time. We ran long uh, about crime, which is, I know is something else that you're you're dealing with, but um, come back once you get back to Indiana and have a little bit better shot, and we'll continue the conversation. Will do. Thanks for hey, having me. Thank you. Safe travels back home. Coming up, President Biden makes an announcement about U.S. troops heading to Eastern Europe. 
what they're going to do as Russian threats threatens to invade. I'll be moving U.S. troops to Eastern Europe and the NATO countries in the near term. Not a lot. Thank you. President Biden making the announcement that now U.S. troops will move into Eastern Europe in the next few days. The thought in Washington is it's very possible that you could see a Russian invasion of Ukraine, where U.S. troops are not, sometime in the next week or so, possibly either before or just after the Olympics. But over the weekend, conceivably, is when a number of these troops are going to begin their preparations to move towards Eastern Europe. The president, who you saw at the steps of Air Force One, she had just landed from Pittsburgh, where at least 10 people were injured when a snow-covered bridge collapsed this morning. Rescuers formed a human chain to get victims to safety from this bus that was dangling from the bridge. None of the injuries are life-threatening. Miracle, considering the bridge. President Biden toured the damage just hours after a, uh, before a pre-planned speech touting, ironically, the passage in November of the trillion-dollar infrastructure bill. That speech was part of a new White House campaign to highlight achievements in key battleground states ahead of the midterms. Bring in Niall Stanage, White House columnist for The Hill, our sister company. Hey, Niall, nothing says campaigning for the midterms like having the Democratic Pennsylvania Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman and the Attorney General Josh Shapiro, who are both running in the midterm elections, not show up at the president's event. Right. And I mean, the White House has been trying to push back against the idea that that constitutes a trend. I'm not sure how much success they're going to have in that, because remember, when the president gave his big voting rights speech, Stacey Abrams didn't turn up for that. You have the two candidates there who didn't show up today in Pennsylvania. I think, honestly, that goes to the president's declining approval numbers and to a reluctance on the part of candidates in um, competitive states to really tie themselves too closely to him. What, what is it? Uh, once an accident, twice a coincidence, three times an enemy action. Uh, right. You talk about competitive states, Pennsylvania, obviously a couple of points difference between uh, Mr. Biden and President Trump, former President Trump. The Georgia poll numbers, you talked about Stacey Abrams, Biden's approval there only 34 percent. That's down 17 percent from May. Uh, does the White House have an alternate explanation other than scheduling conflicts for why these people aren't showing up? Not really is, is the short answer. I mean, the scheduling conflicts excuse doesn't really persuade yeah. anybody. It doesn't even persuade Democrats, really. But that Georgia number that you mentioned is uh, demonstrative of a very, very serious erosion among all uh, demographic groups, it seems, Leland. I mean, this is not something where only Republicans or Republican-leaning independents are turning against the president. We've seen quite significant erosion among groups that are key uh, supports for the Democratic Party. How much weight privately are the White House and the political strategists putting in getting a Supreme Court nominee confirmed early summer? The importance there, I think, is twofold. One is unifying the party. This is something that progressives and more moderate Democrats can come together on. The other point is the president and the White House are really eager to just get something done. Build Back Better obviously stalled, the voting rights push stalled. So if they got a nominee onto the court, at least that would be one more tangible achievement that they could point to for their base voters as November looms. Yeah, and it's certainly something for the base to talk about and the media to talk about over the next two or three months rather than, hey, nothing, nothing's getting done in low poll numbers or who's not showing up to his events. Uh, hey, Niall, appreciate it. Have a great weekend. Talk to you soon. You too, Leonard. All right. Take care. Bye. Why is the world's richest man taking on a teenager? The teenager joins us to explain the billionaire's beef. Few things exude true power like a private jet, and not a little jet, a big one, like Elon Musk's Gulfstream G650. It costs $65 million, can go nonstop from Los Angeles to London. Tail number, November 628, Tango Sierra. Here is a picture of the outside. Of course, pictures of the inside are hard to come by, but here's what a typical G650 looks like, in addition to going where you want, when you want. It's your private jet, emphasis private. Even the FAA lets rich and famous block their tail numbers from flight tracking sites like FlightAware, so Elon Musk could fly privately with complete privacy. That is until Jack Sweeney created the Twitter account at 
Elon's jet that tracks the world's richest man's plane minute by minute. Musk wasn't very happy, and he demanded Sweeney take the account down, then tried to pay Sweeney off. The account's still up, and Jack Sweeney is with us now. So uh, you talked to him last Wednesday, and he went from offering you $5,000 to saying it doesn't feel right to pay to take it down. You think he's going to try to sue you or something, or what's going to happen? Um, I don't know. He probably, So he got further blocking with his plane a further step, but I can still track it. So we'll <laughs> What, how far it goes from here, but I can still track the plane. He can put a rocket into space. He can create a self-driving car. And forgive me, but a 19-year-old college freshman can track his private jet. How does that work? Um, so all planes, you know, they have transponders, and they transmit their location. And basically anybody with like $100 of equipment can track it. And... People around the world, they have a network of these, and I get data from that network, and I analyze it and put it to Twitter. That, that, that's great. So obviously nothing you're doing is illegal. Um, is yeah. there, in, in, in fairness, we're looking at some of the direct messages from you and Elon Musk. You offered $50,000. He went back and forth. Then you said, hey, how about an internship? He hasn't responded to you asking for that, have it, has he? No, no, no. Are you, are you tracking anybody else's jet? Oh, yeah, Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates. I mean, even Air Force One, I have an account for all the uh, VIP Air Force planes. <laughs> uh, what's the most interesting place you found that Elon Musk ever went? Um, I'm mean, Hawaii, probably. Hawaii? Where's Bezos go? Uh, I don't really pay attention, but uh, I think Cancun once. How'd you, how'd you come up with this idea? Uh, so, like, I'm a fan of Elon Musk and SpaceX and Tesla. And, you know, I always follow the shenanigans he does on Twitter. And I knew he had a plane. I had some aviation experience. And I knew about flight tracking apps. And I just thought had the idea for a while. And I finally brought it together during COVID. Uh, originally, he told you that it was somehow uh, a security risk to have his plane tracked. You don't buy that, though. Uh, I mean, to a certain extent, but it doesn't seem to be that big of an issue. Huh? <laughs> it's amazing. Hey, uh, Jack, uh, whatever you're going to do in life is going to be exciting. We're going to look forward to saying we had the first interview with yeah. you, all right? Yeah. <laughs> this is great. Good, good luck Thanks. in your endeavors, young man. Thank you. Uh, we'll let you know if we hear back from Elon Musk. Hope you have a great weekend. Next week, we're going to tackle more tiger moms going after school boards on mask mandates in their kids' education. Also take you to Flint, where they still don't have in-person learning. Dan Abrams is next. Thanks for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.